to please come up and be seated at these tables. Um, All of those who are on the panel, uh, please come up and be seated, and we're going to get started. Um, um, what is it? Uh, I'm, I'm Robert Bird. I'm a minister of Glass City Church in Toledo, Ohio, and this person that's going to be working with me. You want to introduce yourself? Yes, I am Brother Jewel Manze. I am a shepherd at the Marcellus Avenue Church of Christ in Dallas, uh, just, you know, just up the street a bit. Yes. If you'll bow with me, please. Lord God, we thank you for, we thank you for this day. And we thank you for the blessings that are coming with this day when we're able to get together and exchange ideas, we're getting together to encourage one another, we're getting together to uh, just lift up your name and, and it, say out loud what a great and tremendous God you are, how you bless us, how you bless your people. And Lord, we are just praying that as, as a result of our coming together today, we will be better equipped to go out and proclaim your word, we'll be better equipped to go out and lead others to Christ will be better equipped to, to minister to our members within our congregations. Bless the Lord, all those who have had a hand in preparing this uh, program for today, those who will be uh, leading us through the discussions this afternoon. May we do so uh, to bring glory and honor to your name. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Hey, thank you. Uh, I, I want to take the time to um, ask each um, panel panel of persons to uh, introduce themselves, and, and we'll start here um, with, um, with, with Jerry. Yeah. Uh, my name is Brother Jerry Macon. I'm the minister at the West Broadway Church of Christ in Louisville, Kentucky. My name is Jefferson Carruthers. I'm the uh, minister at the uh, Carver Road Church of Christ. Carver Road Church of Christ in uh, Winston-Salem. North Carolina, what's this in North Carolina? Uh, my name is Artrell Harris. I'm the minister at the Roswell Church of Christ, Kansas City, Kansas. My name is Ernest Miller. I'm currently living in Magnolia, Arkansas. I'm not currently preaching anywhere full time. My name is Dr. Kenneth Gilmore. I am the uh, member at the Cedar Valley Church of Christ where Sam Bailey is in Dallas, Texas. And uh, I'm a professor of uh, Christian theology at CFNI, Christ for the Nations International, where I teach international students from across the, the world, uh, helping them to learn uh, the Bible. So I'm glad to be here today. Okay, great, great. appreciate your introductions. Now Brother Menza and I will be leading this discussion. And what I ask him to do is to have three questions. I have three questions, and we'll ask those questions, and then have you guys um, answer those questions. At some point, we'll take questions from the audience. Um, but at this point, I want to start out. This is not part of my three questions. This is kind of introduction. OK, let's be clear. No, oh, OK. Um, and I, I want to make a statement, and I want to see if you can, in a, in, not in a very broad way, but in a very specific way, and answer this question. Um, and again, we, we have our presenters, and, and they certainly can talk from the, their presentation in, in the context of how that fits with their leadership. So I'm going to start out with um, this simple question, and, and again, just a, just a brief answer for me, please. Leadership is? You don't care who goes first? I don't care. Uh, well, the best definition I've heard of leadership is influence. The ability to influence others to do uh, or to buy into your vision. And so it begins with influence and the integrity that uh, you have that people will listen to you and, will, and you're willing to follow. Uh, I heard something that said the person who thinks that he leadeth and has no one following him is only taking a walk. Uh, so, uh, so leadership for me is influence. 
leadership is. Oh, hold on, Let's, we got a senior preacher here, man. They know you, but introduce yourself, my brother. I'm John Dancy from the Russell Road Congregation in Shreveport, Louisiana. Yeah, president. Okay, Brother Dancy. Good no, morning. not president, <laughs> chairman of the board. <laughs> okay, chairman of the board. Okay, great. Okay, um, leadership is. Well, simply put, I, I would just concur with what uh, Dr. Gilmore just said, that it, it has a lot to do with influence. Um, gaining influence also has to do with actually spending time okay. with the people and, and uh, interacting. Um, all of us should be engaged as leaders uh, with the congregation. It's influence, but it's the art of influencing other people to reach the desired objective. Similarly, leadership is for me um, modeling uh, a behavior and moving people by way of example and influence uh, in a particular direction to achieve uh, a certain goal as far as leadership is concerned. Well, I've been, I've been looking forward to this afternoon for quite some time now, ever since I had a discussion with uh, Dr. Seamster and he told me about it. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm really excited about this, this, this panel of brothers who, who are here. Uh, I, I wanted to begin by, let me just tell you what I hope the outcome is today, uh, and then I'm gonna get into my, my questions. Um, I, I think we have adequate time, so, but I'm, I'm mindful of that. Um, it, it is that at the conclusion of a discussion, I, I'd like for us to be able to, um, well, I mean, we'll conclude our discussion today with what clarity has come from the discussion together. Um, in, in some instances, we call this the takeaway, but at the end of the, if, uh, after all is said and done, I would feel really great having participated if I can leave here saying, huh, here's an idea that I can take back to our congregation. Uh, Here's something I really disagree with, and I gotta delve into that some more, cause I need to keep studying that. Uh, are you with me there? Okay, so the, the real charge to our panelists and to you as the audience is that we should look for something to grab, and it's like, don't leave until you get it. Oh, there's a challenge. I know, you thought you were gonna get out at 2.30, huh? But the idea is, don't leave until you have something that you can take home. I'm not talking about the pound cake that they're selling across the hall. I'm going to buy that myself. Leave it alone. I am really challenging us that, that, that we can say, here is something I can take home. And the challenge to the panel will be, here is something that you can take home. See how that works? Little you know, brothers, at, at some point at the end, toward the end, we should be able to come back and say, what's the one thing that you want this audience to take home? And if you got five of them, that's even better, but there should be at least one thing, yeah? I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm not a preacher, so nobody ever says amen to me, but could you could at least just nod your head. I don't have to have the amen, I get it. Okay, so on with the, on with the questions. My, my first question is, um, and, and just kind of, you know, if you, were, if you were kindergartners, first to third grade, I would expect that you weren't going to start at the first one, and then we're going to go to the second one, and then we're going to go to the third one. You guys are super educated and well prepared, so we don't need to be doing this going down the line. So when I'm going to ask the question, just if it hits you, let's just see what you got to say. First question, uh, what thought comes to mind when you hear the term biblical leadership? That's in the title of the program that we're doing. Biblical leadership. Yes, uh, I'll go first since I was just thinking about expanding upon uh, expanding on what I 
just said about modeling a behavior and um, influencing and leading people uh, toward a certain uh, objective, target, goal. <clears throat> Biblical leadership um, would be distinguished from uh, different types of leadership that Jesus even distinguished in his day. He spoke of a leadership of the Gentiles where they exercise lordship over various persons and they are called benefactors and he says to his disciples, it's not going to be that way with you both in Mark 10, 42 and Luke 22 and uh, 25. It's very important when we talk about um, biblical leadership to understand that there is a modeling aspect to that, to that leadership that is uh, persons who lead um, uh, prepared examples who are knowledgeable of what uh, the purpose, mission, and plan of God are as biblical. They model a certain behavior, 1 Timothy 3, Titus, Titus chapter 1, 1 Peter 5, and then they have persuasion and influence as Hebrews 13, 17 indicates by, by the Greek, be persuaded by those who are your leaders and so they can persuade, they can influence, but they model behavior. And then I'll end with this. I think it's important even in the church today to say to our, our preachers, elders, shepherds, deacons, ministry leaders, Bible school teachers, that they are modeling a behavior as well as directing uh, and leading a people. Did you get that? Modeling, persuasion, influence. Next. Yes. I would say that uh, leaders are readers. I would also say that leaders in the church ought to be theologians and to understand our mission and task as men and women of God. And if we don't understand intellectually and cognitively what that mission is, then we can have people who occupy positions of leadership, but that doesn't necessarily make them leaders. And so we are charged, first and foremost, that uh, we are engaged in the mission and the ministry of God. And if we don't understand what that task is and how to articulate that task in terms of the intellectual, the content, as well as the practical, the pragmatic stuff. So for me, uh, I'm calling for leaders to be theologians, to think deeply and richly about what the Christian faith and what the Christian church is all about. Okay, all right, any others? Yes, uh, I would say that the question is, what is biblical leadership? Doing things God's way. Um, allowing the influence of God and the spirit to guide you, uh, directing people towards God, moving people to God's agenda. And then finally, I'll close with leaders follow the plan of God and they help members, non-members to understand the mind of God based on biblical principles. You're going to cover everybody? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. But and I think all of this is true. But to be a biblical leader, not only do you have to understand the word of God as he has already proclaimed, but you've got to understand the people in who you intend to lead. And if you don't meet them where they are, you look behind you and no one's following. So I believe you must apply the theory of Dr. Abraham where he says there are five tiers there and you got to understand where folk are in order to lead them, survival, safety, uh, self-esteem, and stuff like that. You've got to understand the people that you are leading or you can't lead them. You've got to meet them where they are but you've got to do it in a biblical perspective. And that's what I feel like that we ought to do is learn where folk are. If they're hungry, Jesus didn't teach anybody until he fed them. 
So that's what I'm talking about, biblical leadership. You said Abraham said that? Talking about Maslow? Maslow. Maslow. I thought you that's what I thought you were talking about. <laughs> you said Abraham. All right. Thank you. Might as well. All right. All right. Anybody else? Okay. Yeah. Here we go. Yeah, we're gonna go back and forth. I can't sit there too long without asking the question asking the question. <laughs> so, well, I really want to uh, direct this, this question to my uh, other Delphine. I'll call you the Delphine and Ken. You know, both of y'all heard it well for a long time. Uh, in the context of y'all presentation. I believe in high Christology. Okay, in the, in the context of your presentation, how does Christology play a part in what you were saying as it relates to leadership? How do you take your presentation and, and, and associate it with Christ, uh, Christology, Jesus, um, and, 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 and um, how does that manifest leadership based on your presentation? Well, I said in my presentation that uh, to look at human beings outside of Christ is to see a distorted creature. Because if you go back to the idea of the fall, well, what, what did we fall from? And if I'm reading the Bible correctly, the Bible said the fall was not something that spiritually happened only, but it was physical. Death was a consequence of the fall. Everything in creation was affected because of the fall. The zoological kingdom, the animals, um, you know, you talk about botany. Everything was affected by the fall. Social relationships between men and women was affected by the fall. So we live in a fallen world. So sin is not just a, you know, a, uh, a spiritual problem. It's a spiritual problem that manifests itself in all aspects, all aspects of human society. And so to piggyback on what Brother Dansby said, my starting point for evaluating and assessing human beings is not Maslow's concept of what it means to be human. I want to look at the theological aspect of what it means to be human. The biblical idea of hum humanity is that hum humanity is alienated, estranged from God. And so I must begin with Christ as understanding the nature of humanity. We use the social sciences to understand the human person, but the human person, its essence is not what we do, it's who we are. If we are strange from God, then we're fallen creatures. And I need to approach people who don't know Christ as people who are fallen and broken. So is there anything additionally you could say in terms of how that looks, how that's lived out, you know, um, in day-to-day in, in -day life uh, in relationship to leadership and people yeah. uh, in, in, the, in, in, in the faith community? How, how's that lived, actually lived out? How's that actually practiced? Well, I just think that we need to understand that humanity is broken and fallen, and the only one that can put them back together is Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so that may manifest itself in a counseling ministry. It may manifest itself, you know, in a healing ministry, you know, whatever the person's is issues are. But we need to see those issues from a theological perspective. I ask people all the time, I said, you get a degree in counseling. I said, how do you integrate the theories of Jung and the theories of Atler and the theories of fraud with assessing the human person. We don't start with those theories. We start with who God says these people are outside of Jesus Christ or even in Jesus Christ. The first prescription for a fallen humanity is what, God, what does God say? So I'm, I'm approaching the human person as a fallen, broken creature, alienated, estranged, dead, Paul said. Okay. So I got to assess who they are theologically. What do they need? They need healing. They need wholeness. They need joy. They need peace. And they need life. And this is what Jesus said. He said in John chapter 1, he said, In him was what? Life and light. The world needs illumination. The world is in darkness. And the only one, the only one that God or the only institution that God has empowered to be able to lead men to wholeness and to lead them to life is the church. Okay. Same, same to you, uh, Dr. Carruthers, um, in terms of your presentation. How does that look in leadership with a high Christology? What does that look like in terms of what are we handing people? You know, what, what are we giving to them that allows them to uh, benefit from leadership in the, based on the context of your presentation? Within the context of my presentation, Two things I emphasized. One was that there is 
nothing new under the sun. People are the same wherever you go and throughout generations. I do recognize us stratifying um, people based upon when they were born and what generation they were in. But I want to couple that with what Dr. Dansby said about knowing people. Leaders must know uh, who we are and they must know th what we go through as human beings and in life. To know people is to know that a two-year-old has different concerns than does an eight-year-old. And an 18-year-old has a, is dealing with life differently than is an eight-year-old. A 35-year-old has different concerns, as does a 50-year-old. If you don't recognize that throughout the span of history, generally people, generally speaking, people behave the way within those lifetimes from one generation to, the another, to another, maybe a little flexibility. For example, if you don't know 19 to 23 year olds, you probably will make some decisions differently than you do know if you're working in a college atmosphere. If you don't understand that a 19 to 23 year old is probably going to be rebellious, disconnected from uh, the way he or she has been brought up, explorative in his or her mind, suggestive that the generation before him or her completely was out of it and didn't know what was going on, then what you're going to do as they clamor for their identities, you're going to bring them into a room and give them a questionnaire about what it takes to keep them coming to the church. And they will answer on the questionnaire, we need better lighting, we need better acoustics, we need a better a better sound system that uh, communicates not only to us, but in the generation behind us. And then you'll take that and try to shape the church based upon what their concerns are in that age. What I've said is they have the right to explore. But the truth is that you don't shape church based upon age level expectations. You don't teach young people that once we get the acoustics right and the lighting right and the screens right, then you'll come to church because that defies the truth that sometimes you've got to live like Joseph and be dropped in the pit and trust God anyhow. Sometimes you have to find yourself in a foreign land, challenged to eat differently and trust God anyhow. Sometimes you have to face the fiery furnace and your friends will be somewhere else, but you manifest that you are with God by you maintaining faith. You don't change the church based upon life expectations. A 40-year-old woman and a 40-year-old man have come to a conclusion that perhaps they've been married 20 years and I've wasted my good-looking years with you and I need somebody else. Leadership must provide uh, the insight to say, you're at this point in your life, but you've got to hold on. You have to maintain faith, knowing people, leadership. Stop shaping church based upon generational expectations and surveys and shape church based upon what we know about human beings as is revealed in the word of God. Because faith has to be maintained in every generation, regardless of the acoustics and the lighting and the visuals and the people, you maintain faith. See, we, we, are, we are God's people, and our, our view of the world is different from what the view of the world is of people outside of faith, because our knowledge is coming from the word of God. Okay. Now, does anybody else want to respond to that in terms of that leadership strategy piece, um, which is the essence of the question, um, um, in, in terms of how we, how, um, we shape, how we uh, shape churches? ministry. Um, does anybody else want to talk about that strategically? I, I'm going to, maybe I'm going to be wrong, Dr. Bird. Um, can I say great leaders listen to people? Sure. Dr. Carruthers? Meaning that if I'm wanting, to, I want to hear, because I think we got to be relevant as leaders. And this is just coming from someone who understand the five or six generations in the church, who's respectful to 
the, the, uh, my uh, active seniors, but understanding that I think leadership has to be relevant to the needs of the time. I think we got Bible for that, that the, that the men of Issachar, they understood the times and to be effective, I think we have to understand, not that we're going to change the whole church. I agree with your premise. However, I think that as great leaders in churches today, we must listen to the younger generation. We must listen to the young marriage. We must listen to them, then gather, because Jesus spent that individual time with him. If I look at the leadership models, if I look at uh, uh, a Moses, Joshua, Joshua spent tons of time with Moses. If I look at Jesus and his disciples, he understood their needs. Look at Paul, Timothy. Paul with the younger person trying to understand their needs. So the, the point I make is I think that leadership has to help. It's situational. Using the Bible to guide people in situations and it trumps. Biblical leadership trumps human wisdom because what some of the challenges that we have in the church today, and I'll close, is that in elderships or different places, we've got boards of directors Nobody's going to say amen, but I'll, I'll stand there on my own. I'll, I'll stand there on my own. <laughs> We've got boards of directors, Dr. Burke, that may not be in tune. They're in tune on a business aspect of it, but I don't know if they're in tune to the deep, to the core, to the core of what people are going through. I think we have to understand people like Jesus. Leaders have smell like sheep. They got to understand the people. See, I'm of the persuasion, Brother Bird, that culture does not determine Christian theology or Christian doctrine. Christian theology or biblical teaching determines how we approach and how we teach. So the question is, since we're dealing with the issue, what does it mean to be human? The only person that can answer that is God. And he sent Jesus to show us what it means to be what? To be human. And so when I look at people, I'm saying that people who are broken and fallen, alienated, and estranged in what they need, they need the life of God, they need the light of God to become aware of who they can become in Jesus Christ. Anybody that's in Christ, Paul says, is a what? It's a new creation. So I'm looking at them as old creation. The old man, Paul says in Romans 6. So, so I think for me, different than I think what I hear Brother Jeff and Brother Dansby is saying, with all due respect, I think the starting point of where we begin with human beings is not with human beings, comparing ourselves to other human beings, but it begins with God and how, what God says that we are as human beings. That's my starting point. But, but Jeff agrees with what you're saying. <laughs> because I'm, I'm, I'm coming from a Christological perspective, as Dr. Bird has indicated. And what I mean by that is that studying the mind of God gives us insight into what we are listening to hear ourselves. Okay. That is, you're not going to change the truth or the practical experience of uh, wisdom literature that says folly is bound in the heart of a child. What I indicated a few minutes ago, that two-year-old, for example, and I say to my leaders, because we have in, in our leadership, they're not able to say no just when people ask them questions because that's not demonstrating that's right. intelligence necessarily. A two-year-old has the intelligence to say no. Get up, baby, no. Eat your food, baby, no. It doesn't take thought to say no. Um, some of the companies have have, have uh, signs on their shirts that say, say yes. Now, what do we mean by that? That is, what we mean by that is, rather than rushing to be the champion of negativity, let's hear what the people are saying, and as a leader, let's know where they're coming from because we've heard the mind of God, we've studied the mind of God, and through our interaction with people, we can apply the word of God to where they are coming from, but it begins with God. Okay. I stand correct. Begin with us. And I think everything begins with God also. <laughs> but what I said will stand on its own. And I believe it was Thomas Dewey, correct me if I'm wrong, 
he said democracy must be renewed with each generation. I think teaching in a church must also, as Jefferson has indicated, must be renewed in each generation. And many of our generations don't understand God. So you have got them, you have got to get them to understanding God using other means to get them to understand God before you can adequately communicate with them. Now, I'm not a theologian. I don't have all the Bible degrees, but I have a whole lot of hours in management. Well, see, my problem is, again, uh, Brother Dansby, I'm not going to uh, subjugate or subordinate theological truth, the managerial principles. You know, I have a, actually I have a master's in management and have studied the great thinkers of management and leadership. But I'm saying if those models are antithetical at the core of what it means to be human and it's antithetical at the core when it comes to Christian and biblical teaching, then I have to part company with those. So I appreciate, you know, the dialogue and the dissent and all of that. That's good. I, I think we need to have that. But I, I, again, I come back to the point, I think we always need to start biblically and theologically about what it is that we're doing. Because God is the only one that knows what the real problem is. And he has given us into his word. And all we have to do is find ways to speak in a language that people understand. So you may not be a theologian. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't be a theologian. Because to me, that's the starting point. I will, I will say this now, because I think discussion is important, and I think we ought to be comfortable enough to, to discuss these difference, differences in these viewpoints. I think that's all. I think that's what this, that's what ought to happen in this kind of thing. You know what I'm saying? But I got a question, and it, um, I'm gonna be fair with you, my brother. Um, but I got, it raises a question for me, and, and maybe if it's out of bounds, y'all say, "Where's well, out of bounds?" And I go sit down. Um, but <laughs> um, was the biblical text birthed out of cultural situations? So the biblical text was not addressing issues that were taking place um, that the writers addressed. That's, that's all I'm asking. If it's no, y'all the panel. But if, if I, th I think, Brother Bird, the beginning point of the biblical text begins in Revelation. God has made himself known in Jesus Christ in the historical framework. I got you. But the starting point is revelation. Scriptures attest to that revelatory event or experience in Jesus Christ. And Jesus addresses all of these issues, whether social, political, economic, because in the world in which we live in, these issues are broken. Society is broken. People are broken. And the kingdom of God is about the reconciliation of God to humanity and to his creation. Yeah, that's Christology, I got that. All, all I'm asking is that when you pick up the Bible, when you pick up the Bible, the, the, I understand, I understand what you're saying, Ken, I agree with you. I'm just asking, when you pick up the Bible, were the writers addressing Culture. cultural issues that needed to be responded to? That's all so, I'm asking. So, so Dr. Burke, is, it the an is the obvious answer on the surface, yes, but when we peel back the layers of the onion, is it that the biblical writers take, for instance, Corinth? Okay. They are addressing yeah. sin. They're addressing yeah. spiritual poverty in Ephesians. If I look at it, and even if I go back to in the beginning, God created, right? It was the, the world was formed and without void. It was darkness. So it has to address culture. Or if not, it wouldn't be relevant for today. And, and that does not uh, uh, eliminate Christology. Right. Not. It doesn't eliminate that, but I just want to know, is there some historical significance to yes. it when we read it and when y'all study it and then y'all teach it? I think you may need to explain to the audience, what do you mean by Christology? Yeah, like, teach the things of Christ, everything that's associated with Jesus Christ. I understand that. I'm high Christology. I started out with that. But when I read, when I read Genesis and I read the Exodus, you know, um, I, as my, well, I won't say that. But, but when, we, when you pick your Bible up, you just don't say Christology. 
You just don't say Jesus. You take the biblical text, you explain it, and you apply it to what's going on. Say what? I can't, I'm yelling at y'all. Yeah, I'm sorry. I apologize. I apologize. Yeah, yeah. But, but anyway, I'm going to sit down and get out of the way. But you want to preach? Let's get some. Well, well, I, come on, brother. Yeah. The, I, I, brother Bird, I understand your your question. The Bible does answer cultural questions, but one of the amazing things to me about the text is that God can give Moses a revelation in thirteen eighty five fourteen hundred that He expects people to abide by in nine hundred. So 400 years later, it's such a word that whatever the cultural circumstance is, it speaks to that culture at that, at that time. Uh, and that's the difference between the word of God and the word of man. It, it will change. But the word of God can speak to people in every generation and expect a certain behavior from that, from that, uh, from that generation. Yeah, that's my point. Thank you. <laughs> you got it. one more question, then we'll address the audience. <laughs> we don't tell you. Okay. Yeah, like yeah. that's it. If we don't tell you, we're right behind you. Yeah. Behind you. But, but the thing is, we don't text. We don't text. We don't text. We don't text. Thank you, sir. Okay, so I'm going to go to the second question. Yeah, 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 the second question. One of the things that I, I, I've learned as an elder and a shepherd is to shut up and listen. So let me, I, I think I heard some things, and, I, and then let me just check this out, because it made sense to me, and I gotta be sure that I'm right here. Um, whether, whether we're talking about Christology or what have you, what I heard, and I think it was kind of from brother, for others about, we should listen, we should hear people, and then we should apply God's word. Is that, is, that, is that accurate? I mean, is that a reasonable restatement? I mean, here we go, Matt. You were talking about generational expectations. And, and we do face this today. Uh, we, you know, we, everybody coming in with, they, want, they, they have their own agenda. You know, the, the, the young adults want to, you know, they gotta have, like you were saying, special music and special lights and sound and all that. And they're like, I can't do it unless you do it this way. Okay, but that's not unlike uh, you know, when my kid was two years old or six years old, they wanted certain things and as far as they were concerned, that was the only way to have it. So we kind of had to figure out how to talk to a six-year-old so that they understand that, yeah, they can't just have uh, chocolate candy for, for all three meals. We'll do that. So, so what I'm hearing here is we should be listening to our, our members or listening to those who need the word we, we, understand, we hear and understand their circumstances, and then we know how to apply God's word. Yeah. Is, it, is, that, is that an accurate statement? That, that's what I was saying, of course. And, and let me get back to, if you know people, we have some of our young people, for example, who talk about church wear <laughs> as if it's determinative, as if generations before them thought that that was determinative to spirituality. And they believe that people were wearing shirts and ties because it made them more spiritual. That's not what they believed. They were saying they were honoring God in their dress that way. Mm. But they knew that that's not how you go to heaven. But then you have to listen sharply with acute ears to what they're saying. They were saying shirt and tie does not communicate to their generation. But then they bust out with the divine nine clothes, tie, suit, right on. They're dressing in a suit, doing sigma and omega at 19, 20, and 21 years old. But they're coming to church and saying it doesn't communicate. But why does it communicate with the alpha, but it doesn't communicate in the context of the alpha and omega? See, you have to listen, you have to know why young people do, it's a time of rebellion. So next thing you got, you got the old folk now. They thinking, oh, well, good grief, I, I'm not, I'm pretty sure. Let me get my Dallas Cowboy t-shirt on and go to church then. I'm going to communicate. Right. Let's separate, separate what is doctrine from just for what people are going through. 
and we be arguing back and forth over nonsense that has nothing to do with the Bible and then basing their faithfulness to the church off of the arguments they came up with. And then when you got us, some of, you, some of y'all older, older folk, yeah. yeah, that would be me. Start trying to act like them. Yeah, yeah. No children. Okay. No, the teens. No, the thirties. No, no, the fifties. Amen. Okay. Yeah. And, and and this is not my question for for this round. Uh, but in, in terms of how do we how do we get to know the people that are that are in our charge? How do we get to know them? Um, yeah. Yeah. Yes. We may, maybe we should all be theologians. Or, but maybe in some cases we should all be psychologists or sociologists. I mean, there's a lot involved in getting to know people. And part of it starts with hearing them and sometimes just shut up and listen. And then we can go from there through God's word. Okay. All right. Got it. Uh, uh, da, 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 da. Generational expectations. I love that role of culture. Hearing and applying God's word. That's what I took away from what we were just talking about. The question I want to get to uh, is... Um, it, it, Given our present definitions and understandings, and this is now I'm talking about um, this, this notion of um, you know postmodernism. All right, uh, uh, Dr. Carruthers and Dr. Gilmore both addressed this earlier. Understanding how the, the progression from the Enlightenment period, uh, and, and where things started to look better in terms of the sociology and the arts and that kind of thing, and we move into the modern period where uh, man, mankind thought it, you know we could figure it out by the scientific method and and this kind of thing, and then we get to the post period where people are now saying you know well you do your th- you do you and I'll do me. Hmm. You know, and, uh, you know, I've got, you know, my friend is uh, not choosing to be a boy or a girl. Uh, what is that? Non-binary. I don't know all the terms yet. I'm still studying and trying to grow there. Okay. But we get to a point today where uh, there is a different agenda. Uh, you know, we, we be it with dress and, and but other kind of social expectations. My real question then is... As we understand these concepts broadly, um, you know, uh, the, what challenges do you see facing our congregations presently? Okay, I'm saying if we are in the postmodern modern, uh, era, what does that mean to us as elders, as ministers, as ministry leaders? I'm really trying, and I'm trying to get to the, to the meat of the matter now. Uh, and I'm trying to say, what does that look like when I go back tomorrow and we have a meeting with our young adults and they are talking about whatever their issue is. Yeah, in, you know, they're trying to say, well, I want to invite my friends to church, but I hope the preacher don't preach one of those sermons, you know, about repent and be baptized. Well, we expect our preacher to preach that every Sunday. So, you know, what's it? here's my question. Uh, given what we know and understand now, What are the challenges that you see we face as leaders in the church? If the postmodern era is upon us, uh, what's what's the challenge? Well, did you, I asked Brother Gilmore after his presentation to go to lunch and correct everything he said and bring back a report. (laughs) Uh, No, but go ahead, Brother Gilmore. No, I think that uh, contrary, I don't think that postmodernism is necessarily a problem. Here's why I think. Because in the ancient world, there was a competition for truth in the marketplace. You get the Epicureans, you get the Stoics, you get all of these philosophers and everybody in the ancient world. And Paul goes right to Mars Hill, and he's debating and discussing these various issues. So in the ancient world, everybody was not monolithic in terms of their teaching and what they believed. Uh, And so I think in one sense, because the modern world tried to unify all knowledge under scientific investigation, if it's not empirical, if it's not rational, therefore it cannot be the truth. And so in the pre-modern world, they're interested in wisdom, how to live the best kind of life. The modern period is concerned about scientific truth. And then the postmodern says, well, The failure of modernity is that modernity tried to wrap everything that means something, purpose, the arts, aesthetics, all of that, they tried to wrap it up under science. 
And what we discovered is, is that life is much more richer and meaningful rather than just scientific truth. I was teasing with, you know, with Brother uh, Carruthers. I said, can you explain to me scientifically, mathematically, analytically why you love your wife? Yeah. So my point is the, the, pro, pre, the postmodern world, Brother Manzay, gives the church an opportunity to engage the diversity of thought and opinions rather than being dismissive in the modern world. The dismissive in the modern world says faith has no place in the public square. Okay, uh, let me see if I've heard what you said. Because my, my question was, given the reality of the postmodern era, what are the challenges that we face? Okay, and, and I think I just heard it right toward the end where you're saying it gives us an opportunity to hear where people are coming from. That, that's my interpretation of that. Okay. But, can, yeah. can, I, can I make a, just a brief suggestion, sir? Sure. Could we, let's put that in the age group category. Your question is on point, it's broad. If we say, what are the top issues facing young people today, teens? What are the top issues facing Gen Xers? What are the top issues facing millennials? Because I think we'll get, well, this group will get more of that because I'm looking at this group and I see one, two, three, I see six people under the age of 30. 30 to 60. So, so let's, it, would that be okay, Dr. Dan, if we address it that perspective? What else? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, quickly though. Sure. So, I mean, it, Th that's one way to break it down. All I'm, I, I, okay. I wanted to go from the general to I got the you. specific. I got you. I mean, because you, you know, it's like broadly saying we need to be able to hear people got where they're coming from. I mean, I think that is one of the challenges, and I'll just put that out there. No matter the age, Good. if somebody's talking to you from, from two, to, 2 to 200, you've got to be able to hear them. Right. I mean, that's, that's a given across the board. And, and I think your point is well taken, that as we get, begin to slice it down, yeah, their 10 to 12 year olds is certainly different than the 22 to 20 to 32 year olds and you're going to have to do some things differently there and you're going to but you're going to hear different things and, and, and so that's again that's one of the challenges I just want to know are there other challenges for us as leaders you know uh, that I can go back and take to, to the other guys when we sit for our meeting on Thursday night and say here's what I learned in terms of how we can address some of these issues. Yeah, yes, I, and, and I, I want to answer that first by answering Dr. Gilmore on postmodernity. Postmodernity does uh, does uh, give us opportunity to say that we ought to hear truth perspectives from uh, several settings and give people an opportunity to share. But my uh, belief is that it's always been possible for every community to speak truth. The difference in postmodernity with Christians is that we believe there is a truth that everybody must hear and come to an understanding of. How does this work itself out in the church? We're not going to come to Carver Road Church of Christ and necessarily prioritize what people are going through as much as we're going to prioritize the narratives and the stories of life that are presented to us in the text. We're going to teach the text and then teach our people to apply the text to what they're going through. We're not going to apply what they're going through to the text, but we're going to start with the text, learn the Bible, learn what the Bible is teaching, and you will come across the human situation and the human problem. All that's not going to take place in one quarter or one Sunday. But eventually in studying the word of God and in those times where you need to go somewhere else in the word of God, you'll be able to apply life to whatever that person is going through. Okay, so you're saying start with the word of God and then make the applications out. And, and in so doing, if you do that broadly, uh, you will cover and you will, you will hit several different issues. Yeah, but, or, uh, what I'm saying is on. elders, stop canceling Bible class for concerts on gospel meeting day and let folk go to Bible class and have a concert later on. What we need in the Church of Christ is the Word of God. And if we're spending more time praising and raising our hands and talking about some of everything rather than learning the mind of God. Now, I'm not saying literally. I'm just saying here's one of our practices because we don't, we don't prioritize our understanding of the Word of God, which is going to give us a different mindset than what we find in the world. Okay. Uh, I hear you. 
I, I hear you. And I think nobody's, you're not going to get an argument that says we shouldn't spend more time learning God's word and, and getting more into God's word and getting better at teaching God's word. That's a given. My, my real challenge uh, to you, and I'm trying to get as much in, in perspective there, is how do we then uh, uh, apply that in, in, in a broader sense to, to this current situation in, in post-modernity? Modernity. Yes, uh, sir. So if I'm going back to your question, mm -hmm. I appreciate the question. Okay. Top issues facing the church today. Was mm -hmm. that? Yeah. Okay. In, in, in the light of, in, the, in the this, light of this, everything. This I wrote where we are. just faithfulness of members. Hold on. Truth, the argument of truth versus tradition as a younger folks. Yeah. Okay. I'm just. Oh, here. Oh. Okay. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. A vast departure from scripture we no longer value scripture it no longer reigns and rules in our life the younger generation Millennials they've already made their decisions about those hardcore issues we're trying to help them reclaim variables next the relevance of God's Word which the church is facing today not for all every church is different every place is different I wrote three or four more give them to you quickly the idea of spirituality versus religion the younger generation are saying we're more spiritual than religious, which leads to the fact that we had church entity mm -hmm. versus Christianity. Mm -hmm. We had more church entity. So give you two or three more. I think ministry okay. standpoint, I think you got to deal with the mental health issues in the church today. If you want to really get to the core, you got to get to the mental health issues that people are dealing with because if not, the faith is not real. They're working to find a relevant faith. Three or four more. Three or four. Uh, uh, I think the just, church. How about two more? I'm sorry. Uh -huh. Yeah. Just, okay. Just a couple more. We're yeah. rebounding from COVID. Uh, yeah. Okay. We're okay. Rebounding. Okay. That's okay. that's a challenge for sure. Okay. 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 All right. So yeah, because we want to get to get a to get to the audience questions. That's where we're. Ready. All right, and I, and I appreciate great great discussion. I, I just got one for you, Ken. Your scientific method. Are you throwing that in the face of exposition? Um, exegesis, teaching, when you say scientific, I'm trying to, you know. What I'm saying to you is that the modernity has argued for scientific truth. Scientific truth means for them, uh, can we observe a phenomenon? Is it a repeatable event that we can see? And because theology and Christian faith does not fit in the categories of scientific knowledge, again, as I said earlier, you cannot, read, you cannot demonstrate the virgin birth. You cannot demonstrate the resurrection of Jesus. It's beyond empirical proof. So the scientific method dismisses Christian faith and Christian theology. So it is more, it is more alive in post-modernity because post-modernity argues that all truths ought to be uh, in the marketplace for the competition of ideas. And I'm saying that we as preachers, we don't have to defend the gospel. The gospel will defend itself. What we need to do is to be able to be clear about what the Bible teaches and let the Holy Spirit do his job. Okay. I, I, I would just ask That's you. all I'm that. saying. And we'll talk about that later because, you know, I, I got an apologetic. You know, I'll, I'll give an answer. But anyway, we got, oh, let's, go to the, let's, let's go to the audience. Are there any questions in the audience? You got a question? Oh, he don't get a question. <laughs> uh, Dr. Gilmore, in your discourse this morning, you mentioned going into the second century when we're dealing with the church fathers and that the communication to the church was through through them and what they got from God orally. So what role does the canon play in putting together the canon? What was their intent when they put together the canon? Because we keep referring to the word of God, and I assume we're talking about the Bible. And so what was the reason for putting together the canon? And what was the re what, what is, how do we use the canon today? Is it a legislative uh, tool for the church? Uh, how, how should we use it? What's the appropriate way to use it? That's a good question. Um, the canon, the word canon means read or measuring rod. 
So how did the early church use, what criteria for them to assess which book should go into the Bible? And one of them was what we call apostolicity. Was this book written by someone that was an apostle or someone that was closely associated with an apostle? We know that Luke was a, a companion of Paul and that uh, John Mark was a companion of Peter. And so we know uh, that uh, based upon their writings uh, that it was accepted into the canon. Did the book have any level of spirituality? Did it change people's lives? And obviously it did. Or third, uh, was this book widely circulated in the early church? And we know uh, from Colossians and Ephesians that these letters were circulated in the, in the early church. Um, and I would even drop this while I'm passing by that when Paul wrote his first letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 5, 8, he said, I wrote to you in a previous letter not to associate. So scholars make the argument that actually 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 8, that letter is actually 1 Corinthians and the 1 Corinthians we have is actually 2 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians is actually 3 Corinthians. So there are three letters that he wrote. They're not, that was not a part of the canon. The question would be, if we found that first letter, would that book also be accepted into the canon as well? But the early church rejected the apocryphal books. It rejected other pseudepigraphal writings that was, that was around in the early church. So it's not that those books were excluded. The books excluded themselves. Uh, that's the witness of the early church. Uh, they were written, uh, I was talking about this last night, Paul's letters are what we call situation or occasional letters. If situations had not arisen in Corinth, like a man living with his father's wife, or dealing with the problem of the resurrection, or dealing with spiritual gifts, you know, or how should we take communion, those letters, that letter probably would have never been written. But Paul uses his pastoral letters as a way of correcting, guiding, teaching the church, even though Paul is not on site. Uh, scripture is written for doctrinal purposes, is written, as Paul says in 2 Timothy 3, it's written for doctrinal, it's written for moral correction, it's written for doctrinal correction, it's written for Christian maturity, uh, it's written to teach us how to worship God and live for God. So there are a number of reasons. Paul says, uh, Romans 15, 4, we know there's things that were written before time were what? Were written for our learning that through the patience and comfort of the scripture. So Reading that text, what does Paul say? Paul says, Scripture gives us what? Hope, comfort, right? So there are many reasons why Scripture is written to deal with specific issues, occasional letters, doctrinal issues, particularly the book of Romans. I mean, in the book of Galatians, if you look at Paul's introduction, it's a polemical letter. I marvel that you are so soon removed from the gospel. So there are a variety of reasons. Now, uh, Dr. Carruthers is a New Testament scholar, so he could give you more insight on. on but I, I appreciate you got to the reason. Thank you, bro. You, you got. You got a question behind you. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 well, it was written for doctrine and for maturity and the. <laughs> yeah, we. Yeah, yeah. Who got a question over here? Yeah, yeah, Doc. Um, in your experience, what are the best um, or most impactful methods, tools? resources or even programs that you've implemented at, at your churches or communities of faith to empower servant leaders. One of the things that I feel like I'm experiencing um, in, in my context is with my generation, the younger generation, they want to know, what am I getting out of this? You know, I could be here, or I could be there. Why would I sacrifice my time? So I'm really interested in hearing some of the resources, methods, tools, or programs that you have implemented in your context. Is that a question for me or is it for Dr. Car Carruthers? Oh, for everybody, okay. Yeah, everybody. So I don't have to answer it then. Yeah, everybody, everybody. Anybody? The kids say he need a break. So, you guys want to? Anybody want to ask? No, you, you can make a choice. We're not going to force you to answer, but anybody want to make it? You can make Thank you. I appreciate that, Jeff. Thank you. <laughs> Giving me the mic. Um, I think it's, it, it is very important to engage everybody. Um, one of the things that's been said today that is vital is listening. Um, I'll give you an example. And COVID has made this a little harder for me, I have to admit. I had a, we baptized a young man during COVID. 
his older brother, who was baptized before COVID, looked to him and said, you know, you ain't going to never get to work around the table. You know, they, they came in looking, you know, that was an entry duty for a, a, a young man, you know, especially talking about 12, 11, 12 years old, getting baptized. You know, that was an entry duty into the church. That's gone. That's not there anymore. And so I've had to step back and start looking at what can we do to actually begin to actively engage, uh, especially these new convert young people uh, that we used to just have something for them to do. Or we didn't have to say a word and have nothing. You get up there, just follow him, you know, and do that. So we are working on that. We are striving to do that. But it's very important to actually listen and find out. So a few weeks ago, that same young man that was baptized during COVID got up to do dismissal prayer. And the brother that had said that to him stood with him to encourage him in saying prayer. That was powerful. You know, the whole church, I never heard the church clap for a dismissal prayer. But, but that lifted him up. And so we, we, we are working to actually learn how to engage especially new and young people. I got a, a, a young brother that's beginning to sing. We have, but, but we have to learn to engage the guys. And then, of course, there are things we need to be doing, ministry things we need to be doing outside of the worship service to actually engage everybody as well. So, we, you know, we have a, a food ministry at church, and we have more people that are getting involved in that and other things. But we do have to um, hear those things, know that things have changed, and then really figure out how to involve especially uh, the new young people that are coming into the church. So that, 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 that is, that's a very important thing. That is something I know we're working on where I am. I'm sure everybody else is as well. Thank, I appreciate that, Jeff. Thank you. Brother Dansby, you've done, you've done this longer than anybody, yes, any of us. So I'd like to hear your response to that question. I haven't done it longer than anybody. That, well, <laughs> us. Us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I'll tell you from my experience, in order to get everyone involved, I have to go back to the Bible. In order to get all of the young ladies involved, I have to have my older sisters involved teaching the younger ladies. Okay. Yeah. Same way with the older men. That's right. Because we cannot have three separate congregations in one. It's got to be one congregation. And if we engage our senior citizens, men and women, to communicate with the young folk, then we will all be on the same page. That's the way we do it. And it has worked where I am. I think that's very sage, uh, sagacious, <laughs> wise. Um, yeah. Dr. Stanley Tower, we really appreciate that question. It's a question our young people are asking, and that leadership needs to give an answer to that that question. What am I getting out of it? Um, I'm very top down kind of uh, preacher, in that I began with God's expectation and then moved down through the congregation. And so my question, uh, I answer the question as the young person says to me, what am I to get out of this? My answer is, what does God expect you to get out of this? And what you're gonna get out of this environment is maybe different from what you get out of your high school experience or your college experience, because we do something different here. And you can be successful in the sight of God with what God expects you to do here. If we try to meet them with what everything offers them in society, we're going to lose our identity. Our DNA is not going to be matching what we are, we are doing and we're gonna be offering what we cannot deliver. And people have to learn to enjoy God, love God, and want to be in service to God. And we've got to model that and we have to teach that and then we have to expect that. Let me say something just about leadership, how we engage people where we are. It always begins with where you stand with God. We don't have any elders who serve at our church 
who are not the examples of everything we expect at that church. If you're going to be at this church and you're an elder, you, you, we don't have to guess whether or not you're coming to Bible class, you're going to be there. You're going to be at every Bible class. You're going to be at worship on time. You're going, you're going to model. I don't care if you are elder. If you can't live up to the example, then you, you, you're not going to pretend that, that folk got to listen to you because you have the title. You're going to model what you're supposed to be. If you're a deacon, we're not looking for you. We're not hunting you when there's things that need to be done. You already know you better be in Bible. I, I get amazed at these churches talking about, well, we got our leaders, but we can't get them to come up Bible class. What kind of stuff is this? What? Uh, what uh, <laughs> and, and, and similarly with, with, with our ministry leaders, everybody must meet a level of expectation. And I say what the text says, the commandments of God are not grievous to those who love God. Why would you not expect to give God your best? Now, we got young people where, where I am. Y'all had y'all's first DK Kaiosune conference at Carver Road Justice Conference. All, all that. We appreciate all that justice and all that. All, all of us need to be be about justice, but still there is expectation for young people. Don't come here asking to be over the, the bouncy houses until you get yourself in Bible class, all right? If you won't come to Bible class, if you won't be taught, stop trying to run, come here and give us suggestions about how to run this church, because this is the Lord's church. This ain't your frat, this ain't your sorority, all such as that. Okay, uh, let's, any other questions? I'm coming, yeah, yeah, I'm coming. yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Any questions? No, right I'm very impressed with uh, your expertise, theologically, just common sense. Uh, as a senior, um, what troubles us and since you touched on it, and somewhere in here there's gonna be a question. Um, we are offended by uh, young people, and not all young people sometimes, getting up before a, a, uh, a service dressed any kind of way. And I, uh, me as one, I think it's very disrespectful. But I think having dialogue with young people, you get a chance to go back and forth about how they feel, and you, 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 you have an opportunity to set them on the right track. And it's because they have not looked at the big picture. When you bring up that they dress for frats and sororities, and they dress for the prom. See? But when it comes to respect in the Lord's house, you can come any kind of way. I, I, I don't think that's, that's making good decision makers out of them. So if you want to elaborate, you can. I think I made more of a statement. Wow. Yeah, let's give her a hand, you know? You have some I don't know if anybody wants to respond to that. Thank you, sister, for that statement. We appreciate that. I've heard some individuals on the panel correct me if I'm wrong, but you seem very dismissive mm. of culture. Mm. Mm. But you've also placed a lot of emphasis on communication. And so it leads me to wonder how can we or how can any leader have a good dialogue and open communication if my mind is already convinced that culture is not important because many people that are coming to us are the result of their culture. And so I want someone to explain to me the importance of, of that. I was a um, wrestling coach. I, I wrestled in California CIF 
wrestling. My brothers were wrestlers. I, I coached wrestling in Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, I came from a different culture, culturally speaking, than my wrestlers did. I was an inner city wrestling coach at Martin Luther King High School. And just by the name of it, you know, that was not a suburban high school. It was Martin Luther King High School uh, in the center of the inner city. Most of the people who were championship wrestlers came from Iowa and Oklahoma, California, Ohio, and they were of a different cultural background. Um, but when they came to the mat after school, regardless of what their culture was, I taught them the science of wrestling. Inner city African American boys, 13 on the team, never had wrestled before, didn't know any mat science or anything of that nature. Now, boys in orange outside of Cleveland, Ohio, they, they had a different culture. Kids on the west side of Cleveland they had a different culture. But on the mat, there was something I was supposed to teach them about one leg takedown, two day leg take, fireman's carry, Japanese wizard, what to do when uh, to control your man on the mat, uh, how to ride a man, and you got three rounds. And, and of course, people doubted us uh, because we were an inner city African American school with the first year, first year program there. Uh, at the end of the season, I'll uh, cut it short. Everybody on my team medaled, and most of them were first place in the city. How did you do it, Coach Carruthers? I taught them wrestling and the basics of wrestling and it was not based upon their culture. It was based upon the sport. Now we can recognize their culture, but in church, we're making them champions for Christ. We're teaching them how to live the godly life in spite of, not dismissive of, but in spite of at times, and sometimes in collaboration with what was their, their culture. I'm saying we can successfully know where people come from and at the same time, get them where we need them to be in our environment on there. Well, um, let, but what you did not uh, expound on was that you had to break through their culture to take them where you wanted to be. And that's my question. How do we take them through? How do we break yes. through the culture? And the culture is still there. And that's why I was saying it seemed like some people were dismissive of culture. And I'm saying that we must recognize it and embrace it in order to break through it. That's all. Yeah, they, they were athletes. I uh, remember Brother Harris, I'm, I'm sorry, but they were athletes. And how, one of the things I was blessed with, I had a group of four guys on the team, my 90 pounder through my 135 pounder, who during the summer, their culture was to lift weights. And one of the things about wrestling, you have to be a strong person. I, I had never met them before, before that, but when, I would, when they came to the mat, they were blessed. But let me say something about mat culture. Mat culture. There you go. Mat culture. <laughs> I had, every wrestling team had what you call, team has what you call a fish. A fish flops around on the mat till he gets pinned and mess up the whole team. All right, he, 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 can't, he can't win anything. The mat culture, because we developed champions, even our weakest wrestler was feared. Guys on the other side of the mat were saying, I want to go to Martin Luther King High School. And they were saying before they even got on the mat, we're going to get beat today. But the thing about it is, culture, my weakest wrestler in his own mind was a champion. And just carrying that team spirit helped him to win matches he never should have have won. And so, yeah, we, all of these things are intersecting, but I'm saying that we can't make culture the major aspect of how we deal with folk in the church because we are reorienting, reshaping, revisioning these people when they come uh, into the church. And, and I, I know we talked about counseling and all of that and, and psychology and all of that, but to some extent, we've got to share successfully the mind and the vision of God, and sometimes that is outside of the culture they're already in from the experiences I had with, with people both in the educational world and the theological uh, world. I, and I know exactly what you're saying about 
culture people are coming from. That's the horizontal, but we're looking at the vertical and the horizontal. Well, I, I'm not dismissing culture. I even wrote a book called Engaging Culture. So I'm not dismissive of it. Is. I might as well put a plug in right there, you know, commercial, commercial break, right? But ask the question, what is culture? Nobody in this room operates out, outside of culture. Because culture has to do with your values, your beliefs, your traditions. So nobody escapes it. Now let me define what a culture is, if you don't mind. Culture are the trends, stories, myths, traditions that give an overarching theme or presumption as to how we view the world. Okay? Um, for example, what are the cultural icons in America today? Starbucks, Apple, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Popeye's Chicken. <laughs> These are cultural icons. Let me ask you this question. <clears throat> what are the five major cities that influence culture and trends in America? New York, Los Angeles, no, Chicago is not even on the list. The Silicon Valley, right? New England, Boston, the Hydra League schools. Anywhere else? Miami is not even on the map. Dallas is not even on the map. <laughs> Silicon Valley, Los Angeles, Boston. What was the other one I gave you? L.A. I give you L.A. Washington D.C. Politics, money, fashion. They influence you more than you influence them. There's okay. a book I would challenge you to read. It's, it's uh, called How to Change the World. And the guy who wrote it named was Hunter. Hunter said that change in America does not come from the bottom up. It comes from the top. And if you're not one of those cultural influences or cultural icons, you don't even put a dent. Unless you're publishing in the New York Times or uh, published by Simon & Schuster, one of the major publishing houses in New York. Yeah. Your book doesn't even make the New York Times. Thanks. Okay, we, we're, we're going to have to, we're gonna have to um, end this. I, I don't know the time. Let, let, me, let uh, me talk to the coach. Well, let me, well, first of all, uh, I, when, coach, I, I got, hold on, hold on a minute, Doc. But let I want to address, you. I address his question well, on you, breakdown let, of culture. Let, let's do that at the end. We'll let you do that at the end. We'll close with you. But I got, my, I got three questions, and we're going to get to them quickly, and then I'll let you close my brother addressing the culture. Um, but um, Sister Dansby is a senior, so I'm, I'm taking up. Uh, uh, he probably was going to say the same thing I was going to say. I have a very successful son who, when we got to uh, Bossier City, Louisiana, this was in the 60s, the integration was just coming through good. It wasn't really good through here. I don't know where you all live, but not in the South it wasn't. My son and my kids were very smart. He won first place championship in wrestling. But what I taught him, everything begins at home, folks sitting in here. All these books and things are good. Some of these preachers little brain go flat at the top of their head. As God says, some things you wouldn't know until he comes back. But culture is a thing where you need to teach your kids. They're not white, they're not brown. You know, teach your kids that they're black kids. Teach them black history. That's what culture is. Teach them to be who you are. Teach them to follow rules and be obedient. But all this other stuff we can set up here with and remember all with it, it's fine. But everything begins at home. And it's like my husband said too, you gotta know your church members, mm. you know. And a lot of things, what has happened in most of the, a lot of the black churches, tradition. Mm. 
So that's why a lot of things haven't changed. Mm -hmm. But I said to you, read that Bible, but don't try to exceed it and change what the scripture say in the words. Because we don't want don't nobody but you know that Greek. So you know you leave that alone. <laughs> so <laughs> but anyway, I would just like to say to everyone, the main thing God told us to do was be loving, didn't he? The old church is gathered together. They didn't even have nowhere to worship sometimes. So don't let nobody bring nothing into your church. You have to have discipline. If you don't have discipline, you don't let no, I don't let my kids and grandkids come tell me what to do. I tell them what to do. And your church and school should be the same way. Thank you. God bless you. And I love all of you. I, I got two Brother, more. We're going to close. I'm going to go to Brother first. Bird. Yes. And you listen to me now. Say it again now. I say listen to me. I'm going to answer the coaches. Okay. Uh, question in logical terms. We have a mentoring program at our congregation. It's in a neighborhood that don't understand how I speak or how my wife speaks. But she enlisted a young lady from the neighborhood who understood the children's cultural background in that neighborhood and we enlisted another fella in our congregation who was from that neighborhood who could communicate with these children in that neighborhood. That's a breakdown of culture by knowing who to get to get the folk to understand what you're trying to teach them. And it was a very successful program, not because of me, but because of the folk that we enlisted who could communicate with the children in that area. Because if you communicated in the wrong way, they would not listen to you at all. And then one more after this, and then we'll close. I won't be long, because I know we have to wrap up. But by the way, my name is Genesis Henry. I'm 18. I'm a preacher as well. I'll be sitting where you sit one day, hopefully, if I get to that age. Be but um, a few things. Um, it'll be questions to you guys, but also addressing something as well. I have a genuine despise when it comes to the youth being slandered. Um, even when it comes to the way we dress in church, everybody doesn't have the capability or the fortune to be able to buy the things necessary to wear the nice suits or the nice clothes or the nice garments so they come with what they have. But my question really much so is, what happened to the church that raised the young ones. Like, I love the point that the Bible says, that he, he said you have to go back to the Bible. The older people teach the younger people. The older men teach the younger men and the older women teach the younger women. I, I've been baptized since the age of nine in 2014. Uh, the church raised me. I was the church's child. Everybody in my generation can't turn out like me because everybody doesn't have somebody that's in the church that's willing to pull out their own pockets and stop being selfish that's willing to, 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 to stop yapping so much about the young people and say, okay, if they can't afford to dress properly, let me teach them and let me help them. It, it's, it's, so my question is, what are you guys doing as preachers? What happened to the preacher that got his hands dirty in work? What happened to the, the deacon and the elder that stopped ridiculing and taught how to do it properly? Um, my question is, what are you doing? I keep hearing the, for the past few days that, oh, we do this for the youth and that for the youth, but are you even looking at, even with the hybrid church, are you looking at your online demographic to see who you're actually reaching? Because you could say you're reaching the youth, but you can post a video and it reaches nothing and no one. Um, so I'm, I'm saying a lot of strong stuff, I'll say, because it's a highly irritation. I preach to the youth. I've been preaching for four years. I've talked to the, even the older generation and some of them can even take the accountability to say they're too hard on the young people. Why, that's why the church is dying, the phrase that everybody wants to say, it's not true. The young people are crying out more than ever, but yet they're ignored for how they come to God. What happened to come as you are, and then once you're cleaned, once you're healed, to change and be renewed daily? What happened to Romans? Uh, that, that, that's the question I'm having because it, it <laughs> people wonder why the youth doesn't go to church and as in the youth I'm saying I'm 18 people older than me and people younger than me because Christianity just like raising a baby 
no matter if you start at 40, 55 or 70, if you, whenever you start, you're a baby. And it's hard to be a, ch a baby being ridiculed every day that you're living and then expect to still believe in a God. And it's like, okay, why would I believe in the God that you believe in if you can't be just enough to show me? I thought we were supposed to be the moon reflecting the sun, not trying to be the sun. So we can dress in the nice expensive suits and we can speak well on Sunday mornings, but how much are you actually getting into the hearts of the people? Yeah. The church is dying because we're not doing our job effectively. Yeah. Let me say uh, thank, thank. Uh, can I? Have so uh, yeah. Yeah. Man, I'm almost, almost. Man, I'm, I almost, almost wanted to shed a tear because I can, I can feel exactly where you are. Um, um, not to prolong, you know, what it is that I want to say, but just in response to that, um, million dollar athletes need coaches. And, and, and I wasn't, um, I wasn't raised up in the church. I mean, I was baptized at the age of 14, and, but I'm saying that my mother and father never married and so I was baptized in Richmond, Virginia. And man, I would I would come to worship, man, with with just myself. Um, with no mother or father. And craving, never seen my mother or father, you know, eat together or have a meal together. And so I was I would come to worship looking at other families, other couples. And it was heartbreaking because that's not the experience that I had. And I'm saying this to say that everybody crave, listen, from, from being parented, God put people in place as parents, teachers, why to, to groom us and to raise us. But I thank God because of who God is, never even, even stepping on the campus of Southwestern in, 90, in 96, having no mother, father in the church, only member of the church in my family. God put, God strategically placed men in my life um, that, that, that was responsible, that I asked questions, that, that saw the passion that you have mm -hmm. to want to not be a household name, not so much be worried about who knows your name, but that I wanted to know who Jesus was. Yeah. And I wanted people in my life that modeled who Jesus was. And man, and because of your passion, man, God will send people and place people in your life that will give you what you need. I promise you. Um, it's, it's, it's men like Dwayne Winrow, Dr. Winrow, didn't, uh, man, sent me to Southwest in my first year. Paid for first year. Um, and, and, and man, and, and he, he, I don't know if he knows that I know, but Dr. Howard knows when it was ready for me to get ready to go to Harding, man, that was a balance here at the school. Man, Dr. Winrow, man, had the balance cleared so that I could go to Harding. No one knows that, but, but I'm saying that, that I didn't have no pedigree, no, no big name in my family, but God put people in my life yeah, yeah. to make that happen. And, 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 and I'm saying that just like what you said, people that really love God and are interested in your development, we'll stop talking about what you got on. and we'll, We won't be concerned about the dreads, and we won't be concerned about this, that, and the other. We'll be more concerned with who you are developing to be in Christ Jesus. And that's leadership, being able to see you where you are and, and raise you up to where you need to be. That's leadership. Thank you, Brother Miller. Okay, we got what I, I wanted to say. We got, we got one more question. To the young preacher, you want to get that quick? Yeah, quick. Yeah. Um, I also wanted to piggyback on what Genesis was talking about. How do you uh, help a leader that they're really stuck on cultural tradition and they don't know the difference between cultural tradition and doctrine? How do you help that leader? Because at the end of the day, shooting time, you know, that wasn't back in the Bible days. They, they ain't with it back in the Bible, so where we got that from? 
culture, culture. Yeah. and over yeah. time, culture changes. So what looks presentable back then may not look presentable now in the eyes of those who are here now. Yeah. So we, whether we like to uh, agree with it or not, culture changes and we're influenced by it. Yeah. Like I haven't always preached with a suit and tie all the time. Am I going to get shit to hell because of that? You yeah. know, but well, the, 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 the respect, okay. right? And being presentable, what looks presentable. And well, and, let, me, let me say this. Uh, I brought up I'm just, I'm just saying this because we, we don't want the church to be one sided where it's old people and, and then they going off to make a young people church. It should be both. It shouldn't yeah. be old people. It shouldn't be young people. The church should be the church. Let me say from a pre preacher's perspective, um, er everybody's, everybody's going to grow up and get old. Uh, but the point about the ties was not that they save you. The point about the ties was what people, the reasons people give for not warning them or not wearing them. That was the point. And the point was not sincere. The point that I don't wear ties because they don't communicate was one of the things is not true because when you have to do other things, you do wear ties. Now, if you don't want to wear a tie in the assembly, that's not going to condemn you. But I want to say to Genesis, as a young preacher, I appreciate your, your message this morning. And I want to say uh, as a preacher, uh, uh, what the young preacher was saying last night and this morning, toughen up. Be strong, quit yourself like a, adorn yourself as a man. Because as a preacher, you're going to hear a whole lot that can be discouraging, but you've got to be the man of God. I went, these people sitting up here, they, they're old now, but this one, that's Jerry, Robert, Harold. Um, we were all here at Southwestern together. And you know what we used to say on this spot? When the older preachers come in, why y'all riding the young preachers back then? Y'all always, oh no, y'all talk about is a young preacher. We were 19 and 20 then. We couldn't, we wanted to fight. Why y'all always getting on the young preacher? And you know, th that kind of thing. That's cyclical because what's going on is not a condemnation to young preachers, but a warning to young preachers that you need to, you need to be busy about your craft, toughen yourself up. Be ready to act like a man. Don't be persuaded by the culture. Don't be overcome by the winds and the waves. You hold on to God. And a lot of us, a lot of us are connected. Winrow, Winrow's grandmother was born 80 some miles from here. Her name was Beulah May Carruthers. Winrow, he's my, he, he's my cousin. We are, I, can, I can scare you all today. I'm a historian, I'm a theological historian. I can scare you all today telling y'all how y'all are cousins. Some of y'all ain't, they ain't even need to be married in y'all's family, y'all cousin. <laughs> But, but we in the, we in the Church of Christ together. Gilmore, this this young man stopped by my trailer when I first preached in 1983. Stopped by my trailer. They told me about this. Uh, Harold Rollinson had told me about this young man here. He said he think he know more than you, Jeff Cruz. I said send him my way. He came to my trailer in Coldwater, Mississippi, running his mouth like he is doing right now. Well, I'm saying, but God, 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 God is good, and God's gonna keep. Now you gonna preach, preach, learn the word of God. Don't be bothered by what you hear about preachers. Study your craft, quit yourself like a man, and be the man of God for your society. That's what you're going to have to be. You're going to have to be the man of God because there's going to be a whole lot. And then I'm going to say as a preacher, you know, say as a preacher, finally, throughout the years of my educational journey, there were always different things in the curriculum. Preach and minor in communication. Preach and minor in education. Preach and minor in counseling. At the end of the day, you need to preach and major and minor in the word of God, and you're young, and somebody mentioned scholarship, PhD in Bible. We don't have five PhDs in Bible because it's too hard. To get a PhD in Bible, you have to pass Greek, pass Hebrew, pass Aramaic, pass another language, and you're young, you're bright, you're intelligent. Don't sell out, learn the languages, Get your degree so you can help the people of God and be a first-line interpreter rather than a third-line interpreter. We need that in the Church of Christ. And I'm saying to you, again, toughen up. Quit yourself like a man. That is, adorn yourself like a man. Understand there's a difference between a man and a woman. You can't cry and 
be upset about everything. You need to set your eyes on the goal and go there. And I just say something passing by. There's a difference between a man and a woman. Now, I can't go into that right now. This is not today. But I'm saying, be a man preaching the word of God. And my classmates, we all still here. We were upset. They, they told us we wouldn't even be preaching today. And we're all here at Southwestern right now. But we were, we were young up in here. Amen. And I was the boss. <laughs> uh, a, quick, a quick word about our heritage. Uh, that the uh, cultural heritage that our young folk don't understand. You don't understand why I wear a tie. So I'm gonna tell you. I grew up at a time when black men wasn't, a, wasn't allowed to wear ties. Unless they were a preacher or a school teacher. My daddy taught me to wear a tie from a little boy up. I had one tie and one suit and one hat. I wore them all. Because other folk forbade us to wear a tie. So I put on a tie now every chance I get because I wasn't allowed to wear ties when I was your age. So if you would spend a little bit of time studying what the old folk went through to get you to where you are right now, then we would all understand each other just a little bit better. Amen. God bless you. I enjoyed your messages, and I enjoyed yours also. God bless you. Amen. Amen. And we're gonna, I'm going to let my brother close. Now, I didn't mean to disrespect. I just wanted to get the, answers, the questions out of the way. But I want to say this as we close, because I can relate to that young man. Oh, I'm sorry. I can, I, 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 I can relate to this young, that young man. When I came here in 1980, I had gotten baptized. I came here like March of 1980. I, I mean, August of 1980, got baptized. May, May, I mean, March of 1980. So I came here as a new convert. Yeah, new convert. I, I knew nothing about the Church of Christ. Right. I knew nothing about the teaching. I didn't know anything about the Bible. As a matter of fact, I grew up in the hood. I didn't care anything about education. Hold on, Micah. Nothing about education. <laughs> but I came, and God blessed me for coming. Because these guys... But grew up in the church, they never mistreated me. Man, I was ignorant. Did you hear what I said? I was ignorant. But let me tell you something. I stayed here four years. Yeah. And I watched these guys, man. They loved me. These are some of the best brothers in my life. And so I, I get it with you, bro. I didn't, I didn't, and so I, I, I learned. I got loved by Dr. Evans, Dr. Maxwell, Dr. Foster. I got loved by Dr. Foreman, Dr. Green. Yeah, yeah. I got loved by teachers. I got loved by students. I met my wife here. I'm trying to tell you. And it elevated me. Yeah, there are tears in my eyes. Because I had examples of people who loved me. Yes, sir. They didn't have to say it. These Negroes didn't talk about it. I love you, Bert. <laughs> They showed me. So after I left here, I went and got me a master's. I went and got me a doctorate. Hallelujah, anyhow. Yeah, yeah. So I take off my hat to my brothers who got me here in this school. And then my other brothers. Yeah, yeah. And my senior brothers huh. who shown love to me. Man, this is my family. And this is my school. And I'm a servant until I die. God bless you. Amen. Love you. Man, oh, I tell you. You know, I, I learned something. Uh, I, I've learned something of being an elder, and we have got a lot of meetings. You know, Thursday night. Friday night we've had them, Monday nights, whatever. And one of the things that scared me early on was when sometimes in the elders' meetings we would have disagreements. Yeah. You know, some want to go left, some want to go right, some want to go up or down, whatever. And I didn't understand, I didn't understand the concept of passion. 
wasn't that folks were just mad at each other. They, they were passionate about what we were trying to do. And you can have five or six men get passionate about trying to do something, and you have to learn how to work together. Um, and, and so what we've tried to demonstrate here today, I think, is how we can come together and, and share and have an exchange. And it moves us all forward. I said at the beginning, hopefully before we leave today, you would be able to say, this is what I'm going to be able to take away today. Now I got news for you. We're going to have two big men on the door and nobody gets out unless you can, no. <laughs> I was going to say unless you could give a report on what you learned today. I won't, I won't, I won't go that far. But here's the point. Here's the point. Right here? You had a comment. All right, I'm going to do it and then I'm going to wrap up and we're going. Hey, Bert. So about as far as, you know, our attire in church, um, I grew up in the church, and my grandparents always taught me to, you know, dress appropriately, and I was wearing a dress and a skirt every Sunday with stockings. But as I got older, I'm like, you know, I'm used to this, and I don't want to do this anymore. And it wasn't, I wasn't trying to be disrespectful towards my grandparents, but it was a thing of, it's always a topic. And it's driving my age out of the church. I'm one of the few people in my church. Just because people don't have dresses or they don't have suits and ties and it is annoying because does that define my spirituality or does that define anybody else's? Okay, good, good point. Yes, sir. Yes. All right. We're going to wrap up in this manner uh, because I understand there's a, there's a really hot basketball game on campus tonight, so we want to get there in time. I'm going to ask the panelists if they can have a final uh, observation. I also I challenge you that if you can give us something, a nugget of what you've heard, of what you were trying to communicate, what will be important for us to hear as leaders uh, as we wrap up? So I'm going to ask you to, just to indulge this for another five or ten minutes while we have a wrap up from uh, our panelists. Uh, this is not a, re, this is not a uh, major re, re recitation of your, what points you've made tonight. It is uh, what you think, in essence, you'd like for us to carry. If you will lead us off, brother. Well, of course, I can be real quick. Um, I think it's just real important for us to remember, especially from what we've heard, that we need to listen to each other uh, from generational aspect from the cultural aspect we just need to listen to one another talk with one another and not at one another and and as we learn each other better we should be able uh to grow together amen i'm glad that i was asked to be a part of this panel at the last moment <laughs> But all of our leaders here, I would encourage you to read Exodus, the 18th chapter. Every book on management that you would get was taken from Exodus, the 18th chapter. All four principles of management are there. Delegation of authority. That means you ought to be able to delegate. Unity of command means you know who to report to. Logical assignment means that you shouldn't put anybody in a position that they're not able to take care of. And then span of control, whoever you assign, then you need to know how many people that they can supervise. So those principles of management come out of Exodus, the 18th chapter. That's right. Reread it and practice it, and you will have a pretty good foundation, biblical foundation, for doing what you need to do to get to know people. And another thing, the Bible does not say the people need to come and get to know the leaders. The Bible says the leaders need to know the people. <laughs> That's what I get out of it, and I'm not a theologian now, and I don't. That's all right. 
have any big words, but that's it for me. Oh, that works. Yeah. Right. Um, young people, young, young man, young lady, we're thank, thankful for your words. And please don't get from this discussion today that what we're talking about is clothes make you go to heaven. That's not our point. We will make the point that um, what you wear is appropriate for various settings and not necessarily a tie or a dress that you have to wear in a church setting. But I know I have seven children. Uh, nothing wrong with that. They're all mine. We have seven children. <laughs> My um, youngest, I think, are twins. They're 25, wife. How old are they? They're 26. That's my wife there. She had those seven children. But um, eight years ago, when my son entered North Carolina a and that's, that's the largest uh, HBCU in, in, the, in the world. We were sitting there at orientation, and they were talking about to him, he's 26 now, when you go on a job interview, you're representing North Carolina a and Act like we taught you something. Young men, do not show up at your job interview in your Sunday Pentecostal suit, pink, green, and yellow, with your outer coat hanging down to your knees. That's not a job interview uh, attire. The ones who were saying this to them were not 40-year-olds and 50-year-olds. They were 28-year-olds who are now 36 years, 38 years, they're, they're not, now they're eight years older, they're, they're, they're 36 now. And what I'm saying about that is even young people communicate to young people that you wear certain things in certain places. It's not meant to be condemn, no, uh, condemnatory, it's meant to help you to be wise in your settings and Amen. always choose to be wise in your settings. And I think what our senior sister was talking, our golden sister, our senior sister was talking about is even watch the sexual implications of your clothes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're not. You shouldn't wear stuff laid over the ladies' generally that 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 that's clinging everything and showing the rest. Um, and it's not because they don't. They ain't never had that. They had that too. Yeah. And it's not because they're jealous. Mm -hmm. Let clothes represent your people and who you are. But it's not that heaven or hell issue that some of our young people, or maybe some older people made of it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Appreciate our, our panel host Amen. for your, let's give them a hand. It, it's tough trying to, yeah. I appreciate the younger people here willing to raise options and say things. Yeah. I, I was you, I'm still you, I just look, I preach in Jordans on some Sundays. That ain't <laughs> it, for some Sundays, but let me make my statement. As leaders, what I, my takeaway as a leader, I must, we and I must work hard to bridge the divide between the numerous generations in the church to make the church relevant, safe, thriving, meaningful, and about glorifying and honoring God. We have to do that as leaders, y'all. We have to, we have to, we have to, we have to. Jesus, Jesus is the greatest leader ever to grace humanity. As a servant leader, um, he modeled no impact without contact. He spent his time influencing a few to impact the entire world. And it's, it's ironic that we spend our time and we frequent places where there's a disconnect, not just between the old and the young, but we have older preachers who, who don't even talk to younger preachers, who aren't building relationship, yet yet there, there is a model and a standard that we're trying to arrive at, but yet don't have any help to climb the ladder to get there. And so, and so just, just as Jesus modeled what real leadership is, he stood in front of them and showed them what it was. Yeah. And then they were able to engage him on a daily basis. And so he didn't just impact them from, from what he said, but they were impacted by what they saw. Yeah. Uh, and so it's, so it's so important that leadership is not just taught, but it's modeled. 
Um, and at the and, and, and at the end of the day, most of our leaders, we need to bring those young men to you because it's a whole lot. I mean, I wish um, that my mother and father, I was the only member of the church in my family until my mother obeyed the gospel. Um, but at the end of the day, um, growing up with no spiritual father, if you will, needing, needing that type of love, needing that type of energy, and we don't know who whose life will impact if we'll bring someone close to us. Amen. And uh, let's begin to engage and, and be more um, intentional yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. about growing someone up. No, I think about leadership, but I think about it from the vantage point. Uh, in Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, uh, the Bible says that Jesus had compassion on the people yeah. because the people were without direction. They were like sheep without a shepherd. He taught them. He modeled before them. He rebuked them. He imparted unto them. And I think that if we're going to really have leaders who are going to be effective. Uh, we cannot buy into the authoritarian model only. You do it because I tell you to do it. That doesn't work. We need to show them why it is in their best interest to follow the command and the will of Jesus. As a matter of fact, we used to teach, you know, the commandment of God was always about an imperative, something that you have to do. But could we look at the commandments of God from the vantage point that God calls us to a kind of qualitative life that involves us seeing what's in our best interests, that motivates us to want to do what God wants us to do. He said, I set before you life and death, good and evil. And he says, choose life. Leaders have to show people the difference in their choices that they make and the consequences that will, will, will be a result of the decisions that they make. So that passage in Matthew 9, 35 has always been a powerful passage to me. Compassion, seeing the people, having no direction, and being a person who teaches and guides them. Thank you, panelists. Let's give our panelists a, a hand, would you please? Yes. Um, we certainly appreciate your, your willingness to serve and, and the contribution that you have made today. Um, I, I'm a word person, and, and we don't have time to go through all the words, but I hear words like how we should model the, what the word teaches as leaders. We should do it with passion. Uh, we should be intentional, someone just said. Uh, we're talking about modeling. Uh, learning to engage members in the work of the church, especially our youth. We need to work on that. Talk about learning life stages and generational expectations. We have to be sensitive to that. Um, talk about the need for coaches in the church. I like the, 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 the coaching analogy that Brother Carruthers talked about. This is a, a big joke in our, in our eldership. We have a lot of former athletes, and so very often when we get into sticky points in, the, in our discussion, uh, they start making athletic references. Well, I was the only band guy <laughs> on the eldership, so I was in the marching band, so I, I, I just like, when they start talking about these sports analogies, it goes right over my head, and it goes like, put that in orchestra terms, and I'm with you, yeah, anyway. <laughs> But, uh, I, you know, I, I appreciate that. You're a drum major, Brother Manzay, a drum major. You know what a drum I, I got that, yeah. So, so, so I appreciate all of what you've shared here today that we can take away. Um, finally, I'm going to give one argument for why the church has to do its job. Um, when my wife and I, we, we graduated college, got married, we moved to Dallas, and the church uh, in Dallas, Marcellus, basically adopted us. We were just a young couple, kind of first jobs, never been away from home, trying to figure out life. And the church just kind of swallowed us up, gave us a big hug, and after about three years started pounding on us about, when are you gonna have babies? Oh. Well, eventually we had babies. And the church stayed right there and helped us raise our babies. And our babies grew up and went away to college. And when, my, when our kids went to college, we went to the college town and connected them with a the local church. Amen. And when our daughter got sick, 
Once in school, it was the church who showed up and just took care of her until she was back on her feet. Our son, uh, both kids, uh, daughter went to Florida, son went to Washington, D.C. Our son finished undergrad school, went to New York to go to, to graduate school, and we had some apprehensions about that. But he connected with a church um, in, in Brooklyn, and they just brought him in oh, yeah. and stayed with him and, 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 and guided him. And, and I just found out today that one of his <laughs> former roommates uh, you know, is here and again, and he came right up and says, I know you. And it's like, I don't know how you know. I don't think I've ever, he says, yeah, I know your son. All of that. All of that is to say what we do makes a difference. It does. And that's why we have to try and keep working to get it right. Because it makes a difference in the lives of us who, who supposedly know what we're doing. But imagine how it can really bless someone who didn't have that, that, that direction coming up. And I understand that. But there's an opportunity. If we just do what God says and do it like God says, man, we can change lives and make a big difference. Yes, and so I thank you for your, your, your indulgence today. I thank you for being here. Thank you, um, Dr. Seamster, for the, for the invitation and all of your assistance. He, he was over here a minute ago. <laughs> there he is. It's changed. Yeah. Thank you for that. And again, uh, look forward to us. Uh, uh, my only one thing is to die next next time. So we had six preachers this time. <clears throat> we have six elders next time, wow. <laughs> plus the six preachers, and then we'll have yeah we'll have a good meeting. Oh, All right, <laughs> there you go. This is it. So the elders meddling now. So let us you let us. We got one. That's right. Yeah, yeah. That's right. We had a couple who said they're, they're both ministers and elders. That that's good. All right, I stand corrected. See, that's the nice thing about it. And you do this thing right, you, we can correct one another and move on. Nobody, it's, it's just like we're getting better. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for the blessings that uh, you have given to us. Thank you for this coming together that we might uh, just consider how we can do a better job to bring glory and honor to your name, how we can be better servants, how we can, can stand firm in your word, how we can recommit to your word and then share it with others. Thank you, dear Lord, for these men who have committed their time and their talents and served on this panel today. We ask your blessings upon them, upon the work that they do, upon their families. Thank you for this school who has, who has seen fit to offer this program that we might all grow in your will and in your work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 We just want to remind everyone that we'll be getting started at 7 p.m. Uh, this evening for our evening session. And our speakers for this evening, uh, that we are looking forward to hearing Dr. James Michael Crusoe, as well as uh, Dr. Don Burnell Holly will be blessing us on this evening. So that'll be at 7 p.m. right back here in the chapel. Once again, let's give our panelists and our facilitators a warm round of applause. We thank God for them. And you can be dismissed at this time. Please visit our vendors and you can still visit the bookstore. Thank you.